Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. You know, people are always asking me, Dr. G, should I be filtering my water? Well, the short answer is yes, absolutely. That's why this week I brought on one of the early developers of reverse osmosis technology to help you sort out fact from fiction and help you make the best decision for your health. He's Robert Slovak. Robert is a degreed mechanical and aeronautical and astronautical engineer who has been in the water treatment game since the 1970s when he co-founded the company Water Factory Systems. Since then, Robert's been on the cutting edge of water filtration technology and he's taken his knowledge all around the world. On today's episode, he and I are gonna discuss why you should start filtering your water as soon as possible what's wrong with plain old tap water, and whether alkaline water is really worth the hype. Robert, welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. And uh, it's certainly very special to be with uh, a celebrity. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not a millennial who would be interviewing you, <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll make up for it. <laughs> All right, so you've been, let's talk about deuterium. You've been interested in deuterium for a really long time. What the heck is it? People may have heard about it. It's a buzzword right now. Why should we care about deuterium? Well, perhaps the first, and, and uh, I'll try to uh, lead this off with a little humor that Deuterium was a favorite buzzword of mine when I was in the Cub Scouts. And um, I, 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 unlike everyone else, I called my, uh, my Cub Scout patrol the Atom Patrol. So I was a fanatic about the Atom, and it was, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the late 40s and early 50s when I was in the Cub Scouts, uh, the Atom was one of the more fascinating things. And Deuterium was part of that, but um, I became fascinated with deuterium when I looked at it very differently than everyone else. I, I realized that it was like another contaminant in the water, and and we're going to have to explain to your to your audience what it is so it makes sense because here we had something that's part of water that's one of the most egregious contaminants and has a, 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 a as yet undiscovered impact on human and animal and plant health. So it just caught me off guard, it stunned me. I'm going, water is a contaminant in water. So sh should, I, should I describe what deuterium yeah, is? Make yeah, it? Bring, bring everybody up to date, because like well, I say, it's, it's now kind of a buzzword, but I think sometimes the problem with buzzwords is that nobody even knows what the, the word is. Yeah, and I think that's maybe helpful, but I'm going to hold this up. It's not going to mean much to everybody, but it is a periodic table of the elements, okay? Yep. And the, the whole universe is made out of 92 of these things, and, and uh, to oversimplify it. And the first one and the lightest one is hydrogen. Rarely do I find, you know, whether they're just consumers or professional people realize that many of the elements have more than one version or form, and those forms are called isotopes. Hydrogen happens to have, even though we just think, oh, it's hydrogen, 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 it has three very distinct forms. And the first one, which scientists call protium, is the one we all think of, one electron, one proton, that's it, the simplest atom in the universe. And also, by far, the most abundant. About 74% of the mass of the universe is hydrogen, and 24% <laughs> happens to be the second lightest um, element, helium. And together, uh, it doesn't take long to figure out that the rest of the 2% of the universe is all the other elements. And it's, it's a striking, you know, it's a striking realization. And um, so in the, hydrogen, in the hydrogen element, these three um, isotopes, the first one, which, as I said, scientists call protium, 
Now, when that somewhere along the line, that hydrogen in the let's let's call it the Big Bang experience, somewhere along the line, that proton that's in the nucleus of the hydrogen uh, took on a, a, a neutron. Okay. And there is a natural atomic affinity for protons and neutrons. They, they don't mind sticking together. And then at another point, uh, that nucleus took on another neutron. So we have now the three isotopes. One, the protium is the light one. The one with an extra neutron we call deuterium. And the one that we're never going to talk about again for the rest of the show or perhaps ever is called tritium. And that has two neutrons along with the proton. And, and it is, it is um, slightly radioactive and has almost no uses except once it was used. You, you and I may recall this. It was used on, uh, on the faces of some watches. Yep. That's right. Uh, to, to, to illuminate a phosphors that, because of its radioactivity, would activate them uh, and, and it would glow. So, but tritium is so rare now, only exists maybe in some reactors, et cetera, et cetera. We don't think about it. The two, the two that are on the main stage are light hydrogen, the one with just one proton in the nucleus, and, we all, and the deuterium, which is often called heavy hydrogen, uh, has, uh, with the two neutrons, those are the two that have captured a lot of health scientists uh, and researchers in, in the last, well, I, I could say here in the West in the last 10 years, but uh, the Russians were fr the first to pay attention to it in the late 50s. They saw something strange going on with deuterium in life. But because deuterium uniquely enables, enabled man uh, to make a nuclear reactor, and deuterium was discovered in 1931, uh, uh, all hands were on deck to pay attention to deuterium for its uses, not to get rid of it like we're about to do, but to get to use it to make a reactor. And remember, 31, 41, what was even more on everybody's mind was the fact that if you can make a nuclear reactor, you can make something called an atomic bomb. And we lived through the atomic bomb area, era. And so deuterium was the most in-demand thing on the planet. Every country, uh, Germany, England, Japan, America, Russia, every country, major country was trying to make and get deuterium concentrated and because there was a very little bit in water. And they got this deuterium from water because like other hydrogen, like the light hydrogen, two, of, two light hydrogen plus oxygen is a water molecule. Well, you can have a light hydrogen or protium and a deuterium hydrogen combine together with oxygen, and there you have what we technically call semi-heavy water. And there, there's a third water molecule that has two deuterium hydrogen, or heavy hydrogen, plus a water molecule, and that's called uh, heavy water. So there's light water with light hydrogen plus oxygen, there's semi-heavy water with a light hydrogen and a heavy hydrogen plus oxygen, and then there's heavy water. Now, because there's so little, just not to confuse people, uh, because there's so little of the uh, water molecules that have two deuterium hydrogen, we call anything, any water molecule that has hydrogen in it, the common usage, heavy, uh, heavy water. Okay. And heavy water was in demand and it was a, a rush to make the atomic bomb that drove it. No one even thought one thing about the health implications of deuterium at all until the Russians said who, who, who lost the, the, the race to make heavy water enough to make a bomb. 
America won that race, as we all know. But the Russians, uh, you know, went off and said, I wonder what else is about this deuterium stuff? And they started to look at its biological implications. And I think what caught me off guard and said, I have to go into this. I mean, I spent my whole career in water and, and now I'd already been in water as a career for 50 years. I said, I, I, ha I have to take the reins of this and, and see where it goes. And so I went on a search for uh, water that was, or, or I was on a search for information about the biological implications. I'm going to cut to the chase on that because in all water supplies on earth, and I'm going to do a lot of like averaging and, and, and hand waving because to be scientifically accurate about all these things takes too much time and will be too confusing. But all water on Earth has deuterium hydrogen in it. In other words, there's HD, as we call it, H for regular hydrogen or light hydrogen, which I told you earlier was also referred to as protium. We have uh, light hydrogen, uh, two, two atoms plus oxygen, and we have uh, a light hydrogen plus a deuterium hydrogen plus oxygen. Now, those, if you put uh, the, the molecules or you count the molecules that contain deuterium in a liter of water, you, you will get about six drops worth in a liter of water. This is stuff that you can take to the bank. This is easy information and very palatable. So in the world of Dr. Gundry and I, we also call that 150 parts per million, okay? Um, and not everybody is familiar with that, but there's 150 um, atoms of deuterium in every million atoms of uh uh, of hydrogen, okay? Gotcha. Not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot, but wow, does it do a lot. And the Russians said, okay, so there's only six drops in a liter of water. And and by the way, I hope you don't mind, I'm, I'm drinking, uh, I'm, my water today is going to be some, some uh, 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 it's the lowest deuterium water made on the planet. Imagine and, and that. I, I, I drink that water. And I wonder where you got that. <laughs> I wonder. Yes, I got it from the people who we're talking about, the Russians, okay? <laughs> so um, the Russians said, okay, well, what if you have more than six drops? What if, we just, what if we just had a bottle of water made with deuterium uh, as the hydrogen or one of the atoms in the, in the water molecule? What, what happens if you do that? Well, frankly, it looks like water. It tastes like water. But if you and I, if Dr. Gundry and I were sipping on a glass as we started this, we would both be dead on the floor from that. Okay? And this was very striking. In fact, they found, well, how much does it take for almost every life species, plant and animal, uh, Hardly any can survive more than 20 to 25 percent heavy water in drinking water. Okay. In other words, if this were 25 percent, not just uh, six drops, but 25 percent of the drops in here. And I think there's about, well, this is a half a liter. There's about 20,000 drops of water in a liter. So if 25 percent of them... Uh, it, it, which is 5,000 drops. If 5,000 drops were in a glass of water, look the same, taste the same, but uh, no life form, including seeds, plants, laboratory animals, primates, n nothing could live for more than five days. All right, well, this, dumb question for our listeners. How come? Um, deuterium is a wrecking ball for mitochondria. Oh, and I love and my mitochondria. Production. I love my mitochondria. I know you do, and so do I. I've learned to love it even more. So it's it's a wrecking ball, and 
and uh, this was put together really or figured out by the, the Russian scientists and researchers starting in the early uh, in, in, in the early 60s, late, late 50s, early 60s. And they, they didn't do it from a, a research perspective. They simply knew and that there was a, it, it, it was discovered because there was a group of people in the mountains of Siberia that had an uncanny number percentage of people that were centenarians. This is how it all began in terms of its biological effect. Anyway, to make a long story short, in 10 years of failing to figure out what made these people's world so special, I mean, they analyzed everything, social, psychological, religious, etc., but nothing panned out and, and, until someone said, hey, you guys have exhausted everything but one thing. Did you ever look at the isotopes that are in their water, the isotopes of hydrogen? And they go, no, what's that supposed to do or mean? And um, they did look at it and they noticed that their deuterium was not 150 parts per million, it was 130, okay? And they just kind of said, as I probably would have, oh, I mean, big deal. Yeah, big deal. Um, and, but, but they didn't, then they said, well, let's see you know, let's see other aspects. Well, these people were outrageously healthy. These people had outrageous lifespans. And for those of you, our website happens to be drinklightwater, L-I-T-E water.com. And you can download a beautiful digital full four color booklet on the history of this discovery. Okay. It really is cool. And it will give you a perspective. So the Russians owned this science until probably, probably the, the, the late 70s and didn't talk much about it, but they became so, they did so much research in, on every species, et cetera, that they made the connection th that, that deuterium had a profound effect on biological species, etc., plants and animals. And uh, so the question was, well, how? What are the mechanics of this and the, 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 the true biology of it? And ultimately, it took a brilliant... They knew it impaired the mitochondria. I mean, impaired as in did away with them, okay? And... It's like, well, how did it do it? I mean, you know, in the 70s, I'm not even sure we knew much about the structure of mitochondria. I mean, the interior no, structure. I mean, it's very, remember, very, Peter, Peter yeah. Mitchell and his theory was completely poo-pooed. Um, yes. You know, from... And, 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 they, and, and it was, you know, the analysis of it and the understanding of it escaped virtually everything but the Russians. But... The man who came forward was a, of all things, a Turkish, uh, a Turkish scientist, um, Abdullah Algun, that no one knew. Like, where did this guy come from? And he was a pharmacologist, and 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 he's simply brilliant, and 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 a, the, one of the finest gentlemen I know. He discovered what the mechanism was, and. Um, we're going to go as light into this as possible because it will escape most of the audience. But in the, the uh, I think most of your audience knows that the mitochondria produce our energy currency or an ATP or right. adenosine yep. triphosphate and so on. And it does it in the most bizarre way that, that you wouldn't believe it. Uh, you know, it, you'd have to make a cartoon and everybody would think you made it up. But in the process of making ATP, protons from hydrogen, because the hydrogen nucleus is a proton, protons from water molecules, the hydrogen in water molecules, is, is, is generated in some of the processes in the mitochondria that 
I'll just say this lightly, called the electron transport chain. And they're driven uh, in this little tiny mitochondria. And there's about, I think, 1,000 to 10,000 mitochondria per cell, depending upon what its cell's function is. Yeah. So, so the heart, cells in the heart muscle are very rich in mitochondria and maybe the cells, you know, somewhere else that in your, you know, appendix aren't so important and they don't have many and don't need a lot of energy. So um, they, he, he discovered that in this little process called the ADP, ATP synthase that actually spitting out into your body massive amounts of this chemical ATP that it it this process involves a mechanical thing and that mechanical thing is a what I mean it's commonly referred to as a nanomotor yep uh, i could call it a in, in a microscopic Porsche turbo okay because it spins at about the same rotational velocity of 9,000 RPMs. And it spins, and that spinning indexes the hydrogen protons, and um, they enter into this synthase that then produces, uh, we won't go any more deep than this, produces the ATP. So all is well sucks in a hydrogen proton, blah, blah, blah. But we just discussed, you and I, that not all water just has uh, hydrogen with a proton in it. What happens if it draws upon a hydrogen whose nucleus contains a neutron that's kind of stuck to the proton? Because that's what happens. You're not going to tell me it gums up the works, are you? I'm not. I, I would not tell you that. You're, but 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 y you you are educated enough to know that that's what it just exactly does. And sometimes I I I, I tell my consumer audiences who get this in a second, it'd be like throwing a half dollar into a Porsche turbo while the engine is running, and and it it would destroy it and. That's exactly what happens to the nanomotor. Now, there is a massive amount of nanomotors in each mitochondria. Uh, it is estimated in, in the hundreds of thousands. But when you consider that the body is, by weight, is whatever, 60 to 70 percent water, and by molecular species, it's, it's n almost 99 percent water molecules, you realize there is a lot of water. And in that water, there is, even though it's maybe not so concentrated because it's only about five drops per, six drops per liter or 150 parts per million, that there is a lot of deuterium in the body. In fact, if you were to do a serum test of, the, of some of the primary constituents and electrolytes uh, of, 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 of uh, blood plasma, you would see that it contains like 12 to 14 millimoles of, of deuterium, which is more than most of the other s s constituents like glucose and, and other things. So it's abundant. And it's, you know, it's, it's simply running around the body uh, and it's very accessible to your energy making mitochondria and so you're losing them constantly. And I'm pretty sure, and please please correct me if, if I'm not, or you can even add to this, or I'm not totally correct, that we increase in our mitochondria up until about 25 years old, and then it's pretty much a straight line dive down to, to the time you die. And there's more than a handful of scientists who say that deuterium is a major factor in how long humans live. Okay? Okay. So, you know. All, all right. So, how, okay. So, how am I going to get deuterium out of my water? Great question. Um, deuterium 
and I should have said this in the beginning, that deuterium hydrogen or heavy hydrogen, and this this eluded, like it, people miss this in the beginning. This is, and, and uh, most, of the iso- most of the elements of the periodic table have their own isotopes, but only hydrogen has an isotope within its hydrogen element that's twice as heavy as the basic hydrogen with the proton and an electron. If you add a proton, you double the weight of that hydrogen. Imagine, there's no other element like this. When people realized this, they said, holy mackerel. Because isotopes can replace uh, each other in chemical reactions, as you well know, uh, anywhere in the body, pretty much, you're going, imagine replacing anything that's twice as heavy in in your world like like if you go to the gym the next day and i replace all your weights with ones that are the same size but twice as heavy it's going to change your world and your workout and that's really how dramatic it is with deuterium that deuterium has incredible effects on the biochemistry and biological reaction, and DNA, and protein folding, and ad infinitum, all the functions, cellular functions, uh, that hydrogen that is twice as heavy impacts that incredibly. And we are just beginning to learn how vast that impact is. But how do I get it out of my water? Okay. Okay, so what not to do? Because <laughs> you know, being being the, 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 the I mean, do I move to Siberia? I guess is my first question. No, I think you we would be both run out of Siberia because they know they have a good thing. But where <laughs> did they get it? That's a good place to start. And thank you for leading me there. Where did they get it? So those Siberians uh, in the mountains. Uh, Because of this difference in weight, meteorological phenomenon, like cycles of uh, the hydrologic cycle, freezing, thawing, snowing, uh, uh, sleeting, these processes, and and we can talk all day just about this, naturally separate deuterium from light water. They remove some of it and shuttle it off somewhere else as more heavy water. So, um, for instance, one of the mechanisms is the fact that deuterium water or heavy water freezes at about two degrees higher. So you can see in the meteorological cycles of the world what a big deal just two degrees is, right? Right. And, and so that's why it slightly varies around the Earth. It, it's, it's actually more concentrated at the equator, both in the seawater there and in the, 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 water, the fresh water that ends up from the ocean water through the hydro, hydrologic cycle. And as you get closer to the poles or higher in altitudes where there's more radical changes in temperature, these these effects are greater, and, and you may have a separation of the deuterium from the light water. So, But it's not very dramatic. As I said, one of the most dramatic places is Siberia, and it only went from 150 to, to 130. But the key here, and I want everybody to realize this, these people got this from birth till death. They got 130. And the benefits to them, health, longevity, um, you know, w- women were not, uh, didn't have a problem having children in their 60s, for instance. Um, this effect, uh, the, 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 the low deuterium water was in their mother's breast milk, in the yak butter, in the yak meat, in the, in the uh, Siberian broccoli and, and lettuce they grew. It was everything. So their whole diet was deuterium depleted, something very difficult for us to achieve. All we can do is get deuterium depleted water. 
So now to get to the question you were kind of pushing me to, how do we make it? How the hell do we make this stuff? Now, where I said that the, the Tiberians had 130, just for comparison, this water, which I said is the lightest uh, available, this is only five parts per million of deuterium. And it, it is made in, a, a, maybe there's four processes. Most of them are only geared, really, the processes really, where they were originally geared to make heavy water, okay? And, and then th th they That's what's the left over. Water, but, exactly. But now the modern method and the Russians once again lead this whole thing. And uh, the, the Russians have the most modern facility to make this light water. And they use a process called vacuum-assisted fractional distillation rectification. And it's pretty much a very... A, uh, a wildly complex version of distillation in which the distiller is three stories high and water is gently heated through a lot of trick, proprietary, secret technology stuff in these big columns. And as you slowly heat this and vacuum pull it up, only the light water molecules, ones without deuterium, make it to the top. And it's painstakingly slow. Maybe an entire day for one column. And the columns, as I said, they're like a foot in diameter and three stories high. Maybe they will make 20 liters in 24 hours. So the expense, both in energy and time, is enormous. So this bottle, this bottle would typically sell for in the $25 range, okay? And when it's in bigger size, it's, it's, it's less. Our company, our company produces light water in two containers. One is the lowest in the world, 5 ppm. It's kind of, it's kind of our way of saying we make the lowest in the world, we have the hottest technology and all that stuff. But this one, which is 10 parts per million, is the is the workhorse this is the one most people buy on a regular basis to replace the water that they normally would consume as drinking water as beverage water like hey do you do you drink almond milk well now you're gonna start making your almond milk at home with deuterium depleted water you're gonna make your coffee with it you're gonna make your tea with it and also, if you're making food, like, you know, you want to make bone broth or something, you would want to use this water. If you're interested in depleting your own endogenous deuterium, the places that have mastered the making of deuterium depleted water are, of course, Russia, but also Hungary and also Romania. And part of the reason why is that these, these, that the reason Hungary and Romania are in it is that early on, they were really interested in researching heavy water. And they ended up converting the stuff they used to make heavy water, as you can figure out easily, and make light water instead. Gotcha. All right. So I know uh, a lot of our listeners are going, okay, I've heard of this biohacking thing. And... Uh, it's, you know, it's the latest biohacking craze, but what do you, what do you say to your critics and skeptics? And I, I know there are those people. What do you, what do you say? Come on, just changing a little deuterium in water is, is the fountain of youth that's going to turn back my mitochondria? I mean, come on, Robert, help us out here. Well... I would say that I have only scratched the surface, I and colleagues and, and the industry of deuterium depleted water, have only scratched the surface of its impact on, on biological species. Plant, animal, I mean, plants hasn't even started yet, okay? I mean, no one's really, maybe a few researchers. 
but people who are examining its role in 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 in, in the effects on on human physiology uh, I mean everyone knows it, this is profound and I personally believe this is perhaps one of the most profound uh, discoveries in our time for the improvement of human health, anti-aging, and longevity, okay? And it works with animals. It does all the right stuff. There's lots, there's much more we don't know than we do know about this new you can call it a craze, but <laughs> there's only enough made in the world for less than 40,000 people. So it can't really get to be that much of a craze. The people who are into it, I mean, 40,000 people, we couldn't even supply the first three blocks on the uh, in New York City of, of Manhattan Island, right? Right. I mean, it just, that's it. Done. Your marketing is done. So it is uh, a labor of love, and there's incredible amount of research. And every year for the last five years, there has been a deuterium depletion uh, conference in Budapest, where where uh, and it's in Budapest because one of the brainiacs of this technology. Uh, we might call him the, the Dr. Gundry of, of Budapest the deuterium is Gabor Somalia. And he has made an incredibly selfless uh, contribution to the science of deuterium depletion. He also, um, uh, I think I can say this on your show, he, they also maintain a, 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 a cancer clinic in, and, and have done for 15 years studies on the fact uh, that deuterium has a profound effect in the progression of cancer. And so they have an entire clinic. And for your, I think one of the best, best books, and it's been around for, I'm going to guess, 10, maybe seven or 10 years, is written by Gabor Samaye. And it's called Defeating Cancer. Okay? Yeah. And it's available. I don't know if you have it, but it, it, it not only gives you an education in, in the actual, you know, the true physics and biology of deuterium depletion, but he goes through many cases uh, on, in this book. And you can buy this, I, I don't know, I think it's less than, less than $13 on Amazon.com. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh... It's rare. Uh, we can't supply Manhattan. So I'll tell you what, you're the f one of the fathers of reverse osmosis, which, uh, okay, we can't deuterium deplete our water. Uh, most of us could do reverse osmosis, though, couldn't we? Absolutely. And, and should um, we? Brother, yes. But not only it, it, you have some options, but let, let's 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 go into the water contamination game, and uh, I, I I I think I want to start out with this because sometimes I, I forget about it, and it's one of the most important things. But seeking a solution to water contamination is like going to a doctor for a prescription. You just don't walk into the office and say, doctor, would you write me a prescription? And, and his jaw will drop, okay? And, and, and people ask me that, Robert, or, or some of our staff, what, what water purifier should I have? That seems so comfortable for them to ask that. And I'm going, do you realize what you're asking me? You're asking me as your water doctor to write a prescription, and I don't have any clue of if you even need one. Uh, or w w what is wrong with you? So the first thing to, to do is find out what is the nature, the source, and, and the analysis of your water supply. And this is like really, this is so easy now. It wouldn't have been 30 years ago or 50 years ago when I was uh, inventing all these RO products, but it is critical. So you can just go on literally Google Water quality report for 
Tallahassee or, or whatever. Palm Springs. Palm Springs. That's it. Yeah. And it will it, the EPA. It, it's 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 a it's a something that they have to do every year, and it tells you about your water. Now, for the nitty gritty of that report, very few of your get, uh, your audience would be able to understand it. But there are some interesting things. It tells you what the sources are, like oh, it's from upper, it's from in the mountains above. Palm Springs and blah, 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 and it's made from snow melt and blah, blah, blah. Uh, or it's, you know, it's water from 800 feet ground and it's, it's, it's absorbed a lot of minerals, etc. So there's a lot to know about that water uh, that you need to know about the water to choose water treatment. And water treatment for your guests, for, for your type of audience, let's just say, we're just going to call them like biohacking level people who are interested enough to listen to this health science that people typically need to not only protect what they consume in all the forms you consume water, but they also need to protect themselves and their family for what they are exposed to in shower, showering and bathing. So you need something, ideally. Primary drinking water is the most important. And it's possible you, it's po I have people that I go, I've looked at your water report and so on and so on, and frankly, and I just did this for someone up near Jackson, Wyoming, you, you just really don't need anything. And you don't need anything to change what the water for showering or bathing. It's very rare, but it's possible. So, uh, after you read the report uh, and, and we look at the contaminants and we say, hey, you need to have something to protect you in the shower. Let's go for an example of probably the most egregious contaminant for showering and bathing. And most people have never even heard of it. And it's called, it's a group of chemicals called trihalomethanes. Trihalomethanes are, weren't even known 25 years ago. Uh, and, and, and weren't regulated, et cetera, et cetera. And trihalomethanes are formed when the traditional chlorination of water, which was first done in 1913, and I consider, I personally consider chlorination and chlorine one of the great medicines of our time, simply because it probably saved more lives than any drug has. So it's, it's, a, it's a perspective of chlorine. But when you chlorinate, no one ever thought, yes, we don't like the taste of the water, so we got to get fix that, and I can smell it in the shower. But no one realized for a long time that that chlorine chemically interacts with natural organic matter that you might call largely humic and fulvic acids, piece molecules of leaves and twigs and maybe some dead frogs in there, but it reacts and forms these total trihalomethanes, these four chemicals. And they are carcinogenic and they also are capable of causing miscarriage in women. And it's the most prevalent of contaminants in municipal water in, let's say, North America, probably in most cities around the world. And you can, these trihalomethanes are very low in molecular weight. So in the shower, you are inhaling them as well as having them be in, uh, being soluble in the water and touching your skin. You're not going to be drinking it in the shower. And most responsible water purification systems for drinking water, uh, drinking water will remove trihalomethanes, but many for the a whole house water, many people don't think of this. And so I'm just pointing this out to you. I and and I think this story might be interesting. I, I was actually in Florida, in Orlando, Florida giving lectures and so on. And, 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 and a woman came up to me and said, hey, what should I do for my house? And I said, okay, 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 hold it, hold it. 
you didn't listen to me. That yeah. you, I, I have to know what's wrong with you first. So she said, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. I said, okay, let's get on my computer and let's see. I want to show you how I do it. We go on there, we get the water quality report, and I'm going, hey, it's, you know, it's better than I actually expected. And then I go, oops. And I go, you have the highest trihalomethane level I have ever personally seen in a municipal water supply, except in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, okay, which was five times higher than that. And, and, and I'm going, she goes, yeah, and I said, also, there's a note here that you should have gotten four letters, service letters from the municipal water department saying they violated the maximum allowed, okay? Because they can't control it. I mean, it's, it's not something that you couldn't afford the water if they controlled it totally. Now, when trihalomethanes were first evaluated by the EPA and so on, it was allowed to be 150 parts per million. Uh, I'm sorry, parts per billion. And then it went fairly recently to 80. And then they introduced another column like it's called not the maximum contaminant level, but the maximum contaminant level goal. Like what would it be if we could, if we, we lived in a perfect world? Well, that goal for trihalomethanes, often called THMs, is zero. So it's something that can't be controlled practically unless you wanted to probably pay five times more for your water. And not many people will do that. True. So, the, so this woman, continuing on with that woman, she goes, well, what's, what's wrong with trihalomethane? I said, do you have any filters before your house? She goes, no, not yet. And that's why I'm asking you. And I said, well, it's a carcinogen. And it's also uh, it can cause miscarriage in, in women. And you really have a high level. Do you have any daughters uh, of childbearing age, blah, blah, blah? And she said, like she turned white. And I'm going, what's the matter? And she said, while the years, during the years I have lived in this house, I have had five miscarriages. So, wow. and no, no doctor, and this is interesting, especially you, because you know so many, so many subjects about medicine and health. I mean, no, but no doctor would have even thought that. And none of them did. None of them said, hey, we got to look if you're being subjected to high halomethanes. And she suffered through five miscarriages and no, still didn't know. So anyway, I thought that story w would be interesting for, for your audience. So what'd you tell her to do? Oh, uh, I no, I showed her what it takes to remove trihalomethanes from water. And it takes, uh, of, for now this is for the whole house water, which she's bathing in. Right. And uh, so I told her that there is a newer technology and it uses activated carbon in a very special form. And I think, you know that, you, of course you've heard carbon filters for, for a long time, but there's two forms of carbon. One is in little particles or gran granules right. called granular activated carbon. And one is that's much newer. And when I say newer, maybe the last 30 years, that they take that carbon and turn it into a powder. And then they stick and mold that powder together with a binder so you have much finer carbon and much more complex flow paths. That's called a carbon block. That is the most effective technology just for removing trihalomethanes. And so I, I recommended to her she get this particular product that is, you know, a large size carbon block to treat her whole house water. And, and, and that was that. But when you look at the c range of contaminants that are in water, and, and they... Uh, it's over a hundred, not that they're in every municipal supply, but among these 150 contaminants, you've got some of them. Okay. And it's really takes a lot of expertise and they change and et cetera. 
But for your audience who is very, who may spend a thousand dollars a month or more on, on, on supplements, okay? And, and, and exotic new things, NAD and AMPK and uh, things to improve their, uh, activate their mitochondria, your audience needs to know like, hey, you shouldn't have any contaminants. They're more serious than you understand. Uh, and so I tell them, look, there's point of entry. That refers to doing your whole house water. That's the term, P-O-E, point of entry, your whole house to protect you while ba- you and your family while bathing and showering. And then there's point of use. That is to make your drinking water, the water for beverages, the water for cooking. You need both f- for your audience. And almost almost every point of use system out there that's that that's well accepted is capable of removing trihalomethanes okay but not necessarily all the other ones like not many can remove fluoride from the water and most of your audience probably wants fluoride out of the water that's a very tough one so of these 100 and plus contaminants i tell them There are only two technology categories capable. There's only two technologies capable of removing every category of contaminant. And those contaminants, everything from arsenic to heavy metals to to synthetic organic chemicals like glyphosate to volatile organic chemicals like benzene to pharmaceuticals that find their way into the water supply to disinfection byproducts like trihalomethane, and, and, and I can go on, but it's enough. There's a lot of contaminants. A lot of stuff, stuff in there. there. What can you do to know you're going to get them all out? Only two. Distillation plus activated carbon and reverse osmosis plus activated carbon. That's it. And in the last week and a half, I've given... Two, uh, what, what, not interviews, etc., like this, but two water webinars. Because the interest in health is growing so rapidly. I think you're very aware of this. Uh, it's growing so rapidly. I said, you know what? These people are lost in the world of water. And frankly, except for uh, our company, Water and Wellness, where we we sell special nutrients and mineralizing and one simple water purification device, which happens to use RO called AquaTrue, one of my favorite recommendations, but not everybody maybe wants that because it fits on the counter, but people do not have any idea how to source it, how to read about it. So I started to give water webinars to get into the nitty gritty. And I was hoping that maybe 25 or 30 people would show up for this water webinar where we're gonna roll up our sleeves, but instead 250 showed up and it shocked us. Oh my God, and we said, well, we didn't finish and people complained, so we said, well, we'll give one in in, in a, a, about a week and a half. And, and then more showed up for that. So there's a hunger. And what's interesting is I'm really no longer in the water business, okay? I don't have that company that developed reverse osmosis anymore, even though I have the expertise in it. So I'm really, I may make a yet another, co- uh, not a career shift, but a career addition to, to being... Uh, to to providing products, and that's something for for a future announcement. I, I'm not trying to promote anything, but when I talked, I talked to doctors. I'd say mostly in the last 16 years of teaching water as it relates to health science. In the last 16 years, I would always go to to a room full of doctors at the conventions that and conferences you and I would attend. And I would ask them, okay, I'm going to go around the room. I want to see what each of you have. I mean, you guys are smart guys, have for water purifiers and water, you know, drinking water systems, point of entry. And I would have to say that easily 90% of those professionals have the wrong thing. I believe you, yeah. And I realize how dire it is. 
and so I, I'm I'm getting back in the game, and 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 I I have to do something about this situation. One of the things that makes it more difficult that perhaps doesn't exist so much maybe in the supplement uh, in the supplement channel is that over the decades water is there's more hype more misinformation about water and its treatment than and than anything i know about seriously i mean it's a minefield for a consumer and a professional and if you went and said oh i just talked to 10 companies and uh, I, i'm picking this one they just gave me the best idea and I, they sounded the smartest and so on I would bet you 90% it would be the wrong thing for your water supply. So it's much more to this. And look what's happened. Look what's happened. I mean, you know, I'm not a fan by any stretch of the imagination with alkaline water. Okay. Oh, thank you for and, saying that. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's like, you know, the, what, in fact, I actually have a mantra uh, that I teach doctors at the end uh, of my course that they have to repeat along with me. And it's like the pH, and many people won't get this, and the doctors, until they finish my course, don't get it either. The pH of anything you eat or drink is irrelevant in human physiology, okay? The pH. It's not that pH is irrelevant in your body. It's very relevant. But things that have the pH, you're have a, a distinct pH, like an avocado or whatever, lettuce juice, th this, is, this is going to change in the body so that its pH is irrelevant. You are absolutely correct, and thank you for saying that because... Um, because it's true. Because, yes, because it's true. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's, it's actually basic physiology, but uh, yes, yes, it has it been hyped. Even basic chemistry. Yeah, basic chemistry. Yeah, I, you're right. It's basic chemistry. Uh, you're right. So, you know, I'm going to have to, we're going to quit on that note because okay. that's actually probably going to be the most controversial thing that we've said on this <laughs> podcast. And we may have to have you back. Uh, so that we can dive into that, because I got to talk to you about hydrogen water, which is one of my favorite subjects as well. Yikes. But we're not going to do it today. Okay. So, how, where do people find you, find out about you, get on a water webinar? Okay. I'm connected. Okay. So, water webinars uh, and, and a company that serves very unique products. W one that you had actually asked about is 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 my absolute favorite and i had to ask you if you knew about this product because i brought it to the united states 16 years ago and it's this canton marine plasma this is a seawater that has been available exactly like this maybe not in this nice package in this ampule since 1897 it became, it was in the French physician's desk reference from 1916 to 1999 as a medicine. Wow. Okay. As a pharmaceutical. And its history is, I don't think there's another nutraceutical that has an illustrious history. And what we do with this for people is this contains the entire periodic table in the balanced proportions in which life evolved. Now, you know, I can talk about that for the whole day. D did you ever meet or know Dr. Professor August Dunning from Caltech? Did that you run across that? No, I'm not. Please, please look at this, note it down, and your your viewers. Professor August Dunning, super brainiac, one of the designers of the International Space Station, kind of like me, an astrophysicist of all things. One and one day, and he's like Professor Emeritus at, at Caltech. One day, this guy says, you know what? I'm having other thoughts. Why is chronic disease increasing so much? Blah, blah, blah. And, and he just started to get into the biological thing. And he wrote presentations called The Habitat Crisis. Look them up. They're, they're on YouTube. They're brilliant, beyond brilliant. And he asked his students, do me a favor. Would you plot the loss of minerals and trace elements from 1900 to, to, to 2020? And then would you just please plot the incidence of cr these 
10 chronic diseases from 1900 to 2020. And while one was going down, the other one was going up. You already know this, but not the whole audience doesn't know this. And we've had, we've had warnings by brilliant people about the importance of trace elements and, and, and no one really, it's like it was too boring a subject and no one could make money at it. But this is what we mineralize water with. Yeah, my, uh, have- believe it or not, my new book, The Energy Paradox, one of my chapters starts with yep. a Senate document from 1936. 1936 says 1934. our soil is so I think depleted. It's 1934. Yeah, it, I know uh, that Senate document. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I show it to all these doctors and everyone I speak to, and I say, guess when this document was made? And they'll go, <laughs> oh, you know, 2000 or 1990. It was 19, you know, 1936. It's like we exactly. knew this. And that, and I, that's part of my water presentation. That document. Perfect. All right. And so go go look up August Dunning. You will be so happy that you did. Very good. All right. Where do we find you? You can find me. Waterandwellness.com is my my main thing about nutrition and water. Um, and I'm also part of drinklightwater.com that brings in uh, deuterium depleted water. I am also in, uh, a part owner of a company I think you probably know of called Quicksilver Scientific. Yep. They, make, they make liposomal, very advanced liposomal uh, 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 nutrients that go into the body through the, through the oral cavity. So those are my main things. And um, for your audience, uh, they can reach me at R-O-B-T Slovak at waterandwellness.com. And I'm happy to answer, you know, throw me some water questions and, and please join. You can find out from waterandwellness.com when the next water webinar is. I think you'll like All it. All right, everybody, sign up for it. It'll be a goodie. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for your knowledge. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Gundry. It was a pleasure and, 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 and an honor. All right. Pleasure as well. All right. We'll sign off. Bye-bye. Take care. All right. It's time for our audience question. And this week's a real good one. Julie Morrison on drgundry.com asks, I have been a low-fat vegan for 20 years and would love to hear you discuss the huge debate between Dr. Esselstyn and McDougall, who are no-fat proponents, Dr. Esselstyn says that any drop of oil damages our epithelial cells, and those of you who advocate olive and CMT oil. Not quite sure what CMT oil is, but... So, you may, uh, you may know that uh, recently I've had one of the big proponents of a no-fat diet on my podcast, uh, Dr. Joel Furman, famous for Eat to Live, and even people like Dr. Furman and um, other of the ultimate low-fat groups have at least come around to advocate uh, taking long-chain omega-3 fatty acids either in the form of algae-derived omega-3s or even in the form of fish oil, as probably an essential component of our diet. More recently, there's been exciting research primarily coming out of dolphin research uh, and out of Sardinia that there's a newly discovered essential fatty acid, which is called carbon-15. And essential means you have to have it. And we don't manufacture it. And it's in my next book. And one of the things that's interesting is it can only be obtained at the moment from animal sources, particularly milk from sheep and goats, and from fish, and it is a fat. Lastly, I will say this over and over again, the two main trials against the American Heart Association low-fat diet versus a diet high in fat, one was olive oil, the other was alpha-linoleic acid, which is a major component of perilla oil, flaxseed oil, 
or canola oil, organic canola oil. The differences, and these were people who had had heart attacks, and the object of these studies, one's called the Predimed study, one's called the Lyon Heart Diet study, both of the high oil groups had so much better outcomes than the low fat groups that in the Lyon Heart Diet trial, which was supposed to go five years, it was stopped at the end of three years for ethical reasons because the high fat group did so much better that they could not continue the trial. The same thing happened with the, Le with the Predimed trial in which these people had to use a liter of olive oil per week. They had so much better heart outcome and neurologic outcome at the end of five years. So, you know, we can talk all we want about the evils of oil, but in fact, head to head, low fat against a heavy olive oil diet or a heavy alpha linoleic acid diet, guess which one? The heavy fat diets won. I have nothing against these gentlemen. They're all fine people, fine researchers, but head to head human trials say something entirely different than what you're hearing. And if you are a low fat vegan, please, please, please do me a favor, do your brain a favor, and get some long chain omega-3 fats into your diet as soon as possible. Thanks, that's a great question. Okay, now it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from Love Too Many on iTunes, who left a five-star review and wrote, I absolutely love listening to this podcast. It is one of my favorites. I appreciate Dr. Gundry and all the work he does for us. I am currently following the Plant Paradox three-day cleanse. I am on day two and have totally felt the difference. Brain fog has cleared. I didn't even realize I had. More energy for sure. Well, first of all, I am so happy to hear about your results with the Plant Paradox cleanse. And thank you so much for your re your review love too many. You know, all of your ratings and reviews help us grow our audience, which is so key to spreading the word about good health. And here's something else. When you leave a review on iTunes, I want you to also leave me your most pressing health question at the bottom. I'll be sure to answer it in an upcoming episode of the podcast. So there's another motivation to just take a few seconds write us a review, ask me a question. I love your questions, as you can tell, and it, if I don't have the answer, uh, I better, uh, and if I don't, I'll, f I'll figure it out. All right, why do I do that? Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. See you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.